So um, thank you for the introduction and, and the kind invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure to be back again this year. Um, and so as um, was mentioned, I, I really am just sort of a basic scientist and I work in a lab. And um, a lot of what we do in the lab is really study the lymphatic vessels themselves and how they grow and mature and function. But we really are interested in what happens to them in certain disease states. And, and then how we can, um, generally people like it darker because they don't have to look at me and they can look up there, so it's fine. Um, they, uh, in, in <laughs> I wish I had your looks, Cam, sorry. Um, the, uh, the, um, so in thinking about how, what, how certain disease states then can affect the lymphatic system, which is of course what you're experiencing. We also, part of my lab also studies how the lymphatic system plays a role in cancer progression and how cancer can get into lymph nodes. Um, and to do that, we use a lot of live animals and we'll place them right directly under the microscope. And that then allows us to sort of watch the lymphatic system try and do its job and then follow how disease might progress over time and then hopefully think about experimental therapeutics that might help reverse some of those processes. So that's sort of how I view my, my role. And what I thought I'd do today is just take a few minutes to just describe what the lymphatic system is and how it's supposed to work. And then that gives us some insight into all the different ways that lymphatics might go wrong that lead to things like lymphedema. And at the end, I'll just talk a little bit about some work that's come out of labs around the world that are hopefully pushing toward treatments for lymphedema. So uh, first, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And so I'm gonna start with this image. And so this is my, one of my favorite images of the lymphatic system. And so these are the lymphatics that are in the, the skin up in your chest. And the reason I like this image is because it, it tells us a few different things. First, it shows that there's different types of lymphatic vessels. You can see these small little root-like structures. These vessels, similar to like roots on a tree, really are there to absorb fluid from the tissue, okay? Those are the vessels that actually pull the fluid in and create lymph. Those are connected to some of these larger lymphatic vessels. And their main job is really just transport. They take that newly formed lymph and they're gonna bring it back to the blood circulation where it re-enters underneath your, your collarbones. The other thing I like about this image is if you look at some of these larger lymphatic vessels, they all seem to be pointed in different areas, one couple under the arm and then down into the pelvis. And the reason for that is as this lymph fluid returns back to the circulation, it's gonna pass through lymph nodes. So these lymph nodes are really the critical or organs that generate immune responses to our infections. And how I like to think about the lymphatic system is it really helps organize our immune system. So what do I mean by that? So we can imagine my body without lymphatics. If I get a little infection in the tip of my finger, we need cells to go and detect that infection. And we have immune cells that roam around our body. But if it's only in the tip of my finger, those immune cells are gonna have to basically go around and sniff every single cell in my body all the time to try and find the infected cell. And it's even more complicated than that because each immune cell really will only respond to one type of infection. So not just any immune cell, the right immune cell would have to find that. So this is now a needle looking for another needle in a huge haystack. So it's gonna be highly inefficient. So what the lymphatic vessels do is as those root-like structures are absorbing that fluid, they're actually picking up parts of that infection and they'll bring that to the lymph node and basically concentrate all those infections from anywhere in your body down into your lymph nodes. So now I can train my immune cells to just go from lymph node to lymph node in sort of a target wrench environment to see if there's anything to respond to. So thinking about as those as two main functions of your lymphatic system, absorbing this tissue fluid and helping generate your immune responses, we can start to think of what's gonna happen if we have dysfunction of our lymphatic system, right? We're not gonna absorb that fluid, it's gonna lead to the swelling, the lymphedema. And then we're gonna get locally areas that are locally immunocompromised, that they're not able to generate those immune responses. And of course, then that manifests itself clinically. And I don't need to tell you about what that looks like. You've got your lymphedema, and you've got your skin and soft tissue infections, right? So it makes sense. If you lose lymphatic functions, the symptoms that you experience are all part of that. So let's think about a little bit now of how our lymphatic vessels actually have to do their job, okay? And so this is an image thinking of those small little root-like structures. And they have some unique features that allow them to work. And the lining cells 
here are the ones that basically form the tube that's your lymphatic vessel. And the cells overlap each other. Now, blood vessels have similar cells, and if you look at them, they sit right next to each other, nice and tight, so that the blood doesn't leak out. But our lymphatics are designed to have these little overlapping areas. And that basically what that forms is a little valve. So you think of this as a one-way valve, where fluid can actually come into the vessel, but if it tries to leave, that valve is going to close and trap it in. So those little valves are really important for absorbing that fluid and trapping it and keeping it in your lymphatic vessels. We can look at those larger lymphatic vessels because they also have some unique features. First, if you look inside, they also have valves in the vessels. And this is really to make sure that your lymph keeps going the ba back in the right direction, heading back toward your blood. So those also are one-way valves, so flow can only come this way and not go backwards. Those vessels are also surrounded by a very specialized cell called a lymphatic muscle cell. Did you know your lymphatics have muscle? So let's think about why they need it. So as I'm standing here, I'm creating lymph in my feet and my lower legs, and that lymph has to get pumped up back here against gravity, right? It has to get pushed through those lymph nodes, and then it has to re-enter the blood. Now, if we think of our blood circulation, it, fluid gets pumped around pumped around because we have this one nice central pump. We call it the heart, sitting right in the middle. But our lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. It doesn't have that central pump. So it's the vessels themselves that squeeze and contract and help push the fluid forward. So those muscle cells are critical, especially when you stand or have any sort of dependent edema, to driving that lymph fluid back and getting it out of your tissue. And so when we see those large lymphatic vessels that are really just transport, I don't want you to think of them as tubes. They're actually really, really cool. I sort of have an engineering background, so that's a whole other problem for me. But these are really a whole bunch of these little pumps all lined up next to each other. So you can see a valve sitting there opening and closing. Here's a pumping unit. There'd be another valve here. That's a pump. We call it the lymphangion. So your vessel really is a whole bunch of these little pumps all lined up in series. And so I'm really interested in how all that gets coordinated and how that's all sort of at a molecular druggable level coordinated. But of course, the problem is, because it's complicated, there's many different ways for that to go wrong. So thinking back then at this picture, when we think about where things can happen that go wrong in your lymphatic system, you can think of these little root-like structures. And if those endothelial cells don't have that nice overlapping feature, they're not going to be able to pick up that fluid and absorb your fluid. If these larger lymphatic vessels, if those valves that are inside that are helping the flow go in the right direction aren't there, you're not going to be able to push that fluid up because it's just going to fall back down against gravity because that valve won't trap it. If those muscle cells that line this aren't working properly or confused or aren't coordinated in their pumping, you also lose that ability to drive that lymph fluid out. So we talk about lymphedema, and it's not one disease, it's not one cause, and you, know, you, you people know that already, right? Everyone has their individual story of what caused their lymphedema. But when we start thinking about treatment, like curative treating underlying causes, we have to be cognizant that, that there's many different reasons why an individual will have lymphedema. And it could also be that a surgeon came in and cut through a lot of those lymphatics as well. Right? And so there's lots of different problems to solve. And that then also has us to think about when we get to the point of designing clinical trials, we need to be very careful about what patients are ending up getting assigned to what therapy. Because some of these therapies won't be designed for the cause of that lymphedema. So thinking about then the big sort of goal here, and this is something that I put up in every lab meeting I ever give and every time I talk to my people, because this is true. There is no FDA-approved drug out there to improve lymphatic function. Yet. Yeah, thank you. Yet. Yeah. Right now, there's none. Yet. Yeah. But, and to me, that's sort of an amazing fact. We have lymphatics sitting on the surface of our brain at the top. We have it down in our toes. It's in everywhere in between. It is the only organ system I can think that does not have anything, any sort of therapy for it. And so sort of the message you've been hearing is we need everyone to sort of rally. This is the message that you can take to people, right? 
this is when you're talking to people about, well, why isn't there a cure? Well, we don't know why, but this is the truth, okay? So having said that, there are people trying, and so I'm just going to walk through just a few different stories of people attempting to, to develop drugs and therapies for lymphedema. Um, and the first involves one of the very first lymphatic molecules. We call it VEGFC, vascular endothelial growth factor C. Basically, it's a molecule that helps new lymphatic vessels grow. And so this is normal skin in the back of a mouse. So we just put a blue dye in it, and you can see that it's being taken up by the lymphatics. If we put VEGFC, which is just a protein, into the skin, we can see that it can create many, many more lymphatic vessels. And so that's being used in a clinical trial that's being run in Finland. And so really the trial is for um, breast cancer patients that have, have lymphedema as a result of surgery and radiation, usually in the axilla. And what the trial is, is that they're basically coming back years later after the lymphedema is developed and trying to replace the lymph nodes that were taken out. So they're taking lymph nodes from somewhere in the abdomen and putting them under the arm, and then they're also adding this VEGFC to try and spur more lymphatic growth. And so um, currently this is in a, in a phase two. It's probably going to take three, four years before we really get any results out of it. So that's happening. We can also think about a lot of this pumping that I showed the images, the videos of, and thinking about how it's all coordinated. And we've done a lot of work in my lab um, trying to understand how that process occurs. And the bottom line is, again, really, really complicated. And you can think of that as, oh, it's really complicated, that's bad, or really complicated, that means there's lots of different opportunities to start tweaking that system to try and make it better. And so these are some examples of molecules that at least have been started to try in experimental systems and, model, and mouse models and other larger animals that some are seeing an effect on the ability to generate some of this lymphatic pumping. And then finally, with lymphedema, there's also a large inflammatory response. And some of those molecules that are produced in that inflammatory response can actually suppress the growth of new lymphatic vessels. And Dr. Stanley Roxon at Stanford identified one of them, which is this leukotriene B4. And so he started a trial, and I think it was, yeah, lower leg lymphedema, um, to treat with this drug, Ubenimex. And the sort of outcome of that trial was that there were some patients that did respond, but as a group, the whole cohort really didn't show a response. And this just sort of comes back to one of my earlier points, that each individual has their own reasons and causes for lymphedema. We need to be a little bit smarter about making sure that when we try these drugs that it's going to the patients with that type of lymphedema that the drug would respond to. So with that, I just want to show some of the, the folk in my group that are the team that are working on all these problems, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, so the, the, the question is, with a lymph node transfer, is VEGFC sort of naturally produced in response? Um, I think it's a little bit unclear, or at least unclear how effective that will be. Um, but yeah, the idea here is to make sure there is, that VEGFC is not limiting, that VEGFC is there in plenty. Um, in mouse models, so they tried this in mouse first, before obviously they tried it in, in humans. And um, in mouse models, they don't see a large VEGFC response when they try and transplant. Um, and it, again, mouse models, not humans, it seemed adding the VEGFC really helped those connections occur and happen maybe faster too. So again, it's unclear in the trial what patients were selected. And it might be, again, one of these situations where certain patients are going to respond more to the VEGFC and the, the nodal transplant just generally as well. So, yeah, yeah. So, again, so right now, experimentally, we've found a few of these molecules that might um, be able to increase the lymphatic pumping part of it. Um, they also have a huge toxicity because they also affect the heart. And so, like, there's some of these things that we need to be careful about um, in terms of at least getting them targeted toward. The, the specific cells that we want to get to. Um, so we are learning at this point. Um, in terms of valves, no, a lot of the work on the valves has come in development. There are patients with primary lymphedema, and the main deficit is the fact that those valves are not formed and working properly. 
Um, and so there is a lot of work in understanding how those valves form with the hope of being able to sort of reproduce them in patients that have that native deficit. Um, but again, a lot of this is still in the lab, so I'm not trying to say that tomorrow we're going to be rolling this stuff out, but, um, but this is sort of the state of the field right now. Yeah, so I think they sort of are in the similar state of that Ubenimex trial where, you know, some patients did respond, but as cohorts, it wasn't, you know, overwhelming. Um, so, again, there, there's, again, I think patient selection is going to be critical. So for the things that might work, I think patient selection also is going to be critical in terms of getting sort of approvals and showing responses, and then it's going to be a tough job to identify which patients are really going to respond the best. So, like I said, lymphedema is not a single disease and a single cause, and I think that makes, it complicates a lot of the, 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 the efforts. And we've seen this sort of coming from the cancer world. We've seen it over and over again where clinical trials will fail in a cancer therapy. And it's because the drug worked in 10% of the patients and didn't work in 90, but it really worked well in 10% of patients. So I think we have to be careful that in the lymphedema world that we don't fall into that same trap. No. Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know of anyone doing that. I can say right now that the lymphatic muscle cell has not even, like, and it's something I'm trying to do in my lab, but we haven't even identified where it comes from in development, right? So on that level, no. Lymphatic endothelial cells, we do know where they come from. Um, in terms of doing like a gene therapy or stem cell approach, I don't know if anyone's tried that in primary lymphedema yet. No. What? No one legitimate is the answer from Dr. Ehrlich over here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, so for um, sort of, this falls under the vascular anomaly. So one of the other reasons you can get lymphedema is if you have sort of basically a, a, a nest, sort of a wild nest of lymphatic vessels that grew, and that could then basically block a whole region from draining. And so sirolimus um, is a drug that affects endothelial cells generally, but lymphatic endothelial cells as well. And so the idea was to try and cause regression of the cells that were causing the nest of, of the cancer to try and, and I don't want to say it's a, the, 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 it's not really a tumor. It's just like this clump of vessels, but hopefully trying to regress it and prevent that overgrowth from occurring so that you can sort of get like a nice straight shot through from, you know, point A to point B. Um, so I know it's been very successful in hemangiomas, lymphangiomas. They've tried it in um, other sort of lymphatic-based tumors called Gorm's disease, um, and it's had some success there as well. Um, and it's been used in a variety of other cancer applications. All right, thank you.